We're called to worship today by the words of the psalmist in Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered, O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. And now let us praise our Lord Jesus Christ as we sing together hymn number 135, Fairest Lord Jesus. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and God's truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, our God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As God's people, let us now bow together in prayer as corporately we confess our sins. O oh, merciful God, look on us as we confess our shortcomings and sins. How prone we are to evil, how slow to do good, how easily deceived by the values of the world, and how blind to the things that belong to our peace, how easily led astray by self-indulgence, and how slow to practice self-discipline, how glibly we blame others, and how slow we are to blame ourselves. Father, forgive us for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now let us in silence confess our personal sins to God.
Amen. Dear friends, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. That new life has begun. Dear friends, believe the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. By His grace, we are forgiven. Amen. in the uh, Raleigh area. You come to the Mrs. Louisa Walters, the uh, mo mother of Sue Briggs, will be, has, was received this Sunday by, as an affiliate member, and her membership is in uh, an Episcopal Church in Atlanta, Georgia, so we welcome as well Mrs. Louisa Walters this Sunday morning. And the family is accompanied by, why don't you stand, Ms. Walters, to be able to see who you are. Nominated by Molly Briggs, the youngest of the Briggs clan. Next is our privilege to receive uh, Mrs. Betty Durham. Uh, Betty uh, joins by transfer from the University Baptist Church in Chapel Hill. Say that she is a sister in law of our member, uh, Mrs. Carl Rice, Diane Rice. And also, Marion Fuller is the elder sponsor this Sunday for Ms. Jackie Webster. Jackie? was received by transfer from the Mount Bethel Presbyterian Church of Durham, North Carolina. In addition, it was our pleasure this morning to receive Mr. David Griffith, Jr. David Johns by reaffirmation of faith. Also, it was our pleasure to receive uh, Ms. Bobby Jo Cotterba. That's close, <laughs> Bobby Jo. I've been working on this thing. <coughs> Bobby Joe is received by reaffirmation of faith. We're going to get, uh, well, next, uh, Patricia Morrow, who received by reaffirmation of faith, and the elder sponsor of Dr. Alan Bowie. Alan, we had you to get these uh, folks out first, okay? The many of these individuals were in the orientation class, and uh, Mary Fanta was one of the lay leaders, and Ray and Jan Denny uh, assisted uh, Dr. Jim Ellis. So, uh, are thankful for the participation of these individuals uh, in the orientation class. I address to you these statements. You've been received into the membership of this congregation from another Christian church. As we do so, we acknowledge that we are members of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And because of this, you did not come to us as strangers but as brother and brothers and sisters in the law. It is recorded in the epistle to the Ephesians. There is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. And I address this one question to you. Do you promise to be a faithful member of this congregation, giving of yourself in every way, and by so doing, fulfilling your calling, as a disciple of Jesus Christ the Lord. Will you answer? I do. I do. Let us pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we praise you for calling us to be a servant people and for gathering us into the body of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for choosing to add to our number these brothers and sisters in faith. Together may we live in your spirit and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ our Lord 
to whom we give honor and glory forever. Amen. We welcome our new members this Sunday, and as Dr. Eller presents to them the certificate of membership, you are invited to come forward at the close of the service and extend to our new members the Sir? right hand of fellowship. Bless you. Uh, please uh, introduce yourself to the elder sponsor. Give that to so the elder sponsor in turn introduce you to our new members, and we welcome Mrs. Walter to come forward, and also Molly, if you'd like to do that too. God bless you. Special welcome to those of you who worship with us by way of WYED TV. We are located as a Presbyterian congregation in Raleigh, North Carolina, right across the street from the Capitol. And we welcome you to worship this Sunday. We're thankful for your participation in this service of worship, for your prayers, and for your financial contributions, which make this special ministry possible. I say it is good to be back with you. I've been on vacation. We were in Tennessee and Northeast Mississippi for a family reunion. And uh, Martha Dale and I and Sarah Dale, who came over from Dallas, Texas, had a good time playing with the grandchildren. And uh, it's amazing how s soon you forget what the schedule is of a five-year-old and a three-year-old and a one-year-old. But we had fun being reacclimated. It is good for us to be in worship this Sunday, an opportunity for us to grow in faith and service to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Our Old Testament lesson is taken from the book of Exodus. We shall read selected verses from chapters 3 and 4 of Exodus. If you are following along, we will begin our reading with the 10th verse of chapter 3. In order to set the context for this particular passage, let me remind you that this is the occasion when Moses was in the wilderness near Mount Horeb, where God came to him miraculously through a bush that was burning, and yet it was not consumed. And then God called Moses to go back to Egypt to deliver his people from their bondage. And so we take up our reading at verse 10, and God speaks to Moses, saying, So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you, that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God in this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. And then as we continue, we turn to chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered, But suppose they do not believe me or listen to me, but say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is in your hand? He said, A staff. And God said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw the staff on the ground, and it became a snake. And Moses drew back from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and seize it by the tail. So he reached out his hand and grasped it, and it became a staff in his hand. And then moving down to verse 10. But Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past or even now, that you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. But Moses said, O my Lord, please, Send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, What of your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he can speak fluently. Even now he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, his heart will be glad. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what you shall do. He indeed shall speak for you to the people. He shall serve as a mouth for you, and you shall serve as God for him. Take in your hand this staff with which you shall perform the signs. Here ends the reading of our Old Testament lesson. We continue our reading of Scripture from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. reading verses 1 through 9, as we consider for our sermon topic this Sunday, God's call to reluctant servants. Let us hear this word. Meanwhile, Saul 
still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Thus endeth this reading of God's word. Let us sing together the hymn, Jesus Calls Us, hymn number 269. Be seated. Let us hear our gospel lesson from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, beginning at verse 21. A familiar passage of Scripture in terms of how one responds to the call of God in Jesus Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, that this must ever happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? May God bless to our reading and to our understanding these passages of Scripture from the lectionary this Sunday morning. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts in worship this day be acceptable to Thee, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. God's call to reluctant servants. If we are honest, all of us from time to time are reluctant 
in living life fully or in serving God fully. Coming to faith in Jesus Christ and responding with our lives to serve him means when we are prone to be reluctant that we must move past any perceived limitations that we think we have. We must be able to move past guilt. We must be able to move past any of our foibles. We must be able to move past weaknesses. Two scenarios make this point. In Memphis, Tennessee, when I was a pastor, I knew an individual who was the head of his real estate company, whom I shall call simply by the name Charles. Charles was not really a church person in the sense of growing up in his church. His parents had not been church people. Charles attended church, but he never felt that he was good enough to be baptized. He felt spiritually inadequate. There had been so much pain from the past, the nasty, the divorce, uh, the frustrations with children, and the failures of one of his sons. And the question for Charles was, how could all this past guilt be wiped away? How could he find fulfillment and new direction? A second scenario takes place at Davidson College, and I will eventually mention this individual's name. It is the spring of 1931. He had not wanted to do it, this student, but he had led the chapel service that day. A fraternity brother had asked him to do it. The fraternity brother headed the YMCA, and they coordinated the chapel services for that block of time, and he did it. He went to get his mail. And there was a note to come to the office of one of his professors, a scholar, a Rhodes, former Rhodes scholar. And as this individual tells it, I told it to us students at Union Theological Seminary, it was a meeting with, with very radical implications. He was from Laurenburg. He was a business major. And he had enrolled at Harvard School of Business in the fall, and that's where he wanted to go, and then to the family business at Laurenburg. He knocked on the door, and this voice came out, come in. He went in, and the August scholar looked up and said, ah, Mr. Jones, your content was superb today. Your elocution was weak, but you can overcome that. You must consider being a Presbyterian minister. And the student, uh, Mr. Jones, said, well, I I'm enrolled at Harvard School of Business. And the voice came back from the desk, reconsider. That's not where you call. Good day, Mr. Jones. Well, in the fall of 1931, he did enroll at Union Theological Seminary in Virginia with a great leap of faith. He died in the mid-1960s, but James Archibald Jones left his footprints in North Carolina and in Virginia. After seminary, he served as a pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Henderson, where Rick Brand, our former associate pastor, was just installed several weeks ago. Then for 16 years as a pastor of the Myers Park Presbyterian Church in Charlotte, and then was called to be the president of Union Theological Seminary in Virginia. But what about Charles? Charles is now an elder in the Presbyterian Church in Memphis. A friend uh, the ch in the church where Charles had been attending uh, on a regular basis but had never joined, invited him to participate in a Bible study fellowship group, much like our serendipity, small ministry groups. And through that small group and the support of that group and the scripture, which was part of the program over a period of months, Charles was able to come to grips by the grace of God with his guilt and sensed that somehow, as he accepted Christ, he could be forgiven and could make a new start in his life. He then became a member of the inquirer's class, was baptized and confirmed. Charles and James A. Jones, two different individuals, but yet with a common thread, having to overcome perceived limitations in order to taste life fully. The means of grace by God comes to us in spite of ourselves. God's love continues to reach out to us despite our perceived limitations, despite our guilt, despite our frailties, despite anything that we put in the way of us 
tasting life fully or responding to the call of God to serve him fully. Perhaps there are worshipers here this morning as Charles who are wrestling with a decision to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Perhaps there are others of you who have accepted Christ, but you have waned in your own spiritual commitment, and you need to set things right with God through a recommitment. Perhaps there are others of you who say, yes, Lord, I know that I should be doing this, but I feel so inadequate. Perhaps there are others of you in terms of your life and what you're doing with your life that that you are not doing something because you perceive that you cannot do it because of whatever the limitation is. And perhaps there are students here today beginning college or university the first time or perhaps beginning a new semester and you think, you know, another commitment? I've got so much that's boggling my mind right now and how am I to consider something else? Lord. As we read the scriptures this morning, we find encouragement in the midst of our limitations. For if you remember nothing else of the sermon this morning, it is this. God's call to reluctant servants like you and me is past any perceived limitations and frailties, whether they be spiritual or physical or psychological or whatever. God's call to reluctant servants like you and me is past any limitations at all, even though those limitations may still be in effect, particularly if we have a physical disability. In our Exodus passage, Moses, Moses, at the burning bush, gave God four excuses, four alibis as to why he could not do anything. He was no initial, enthusiastic respondent to God. He didn't want to have anything to do with what God had in mind for him to do. The central figure of our religious faith was very human, very human. He gave God four excuses. First, I have no credentials. Well, what am, who am I to do this? Secondly, who can I say has sent me so that they will believe me? Third, what authority can I exhibit in the way of power or signs? And fourth, Lord, I am not eloquent. And scholars believe perhaps he may have had a speech impediment, a stammerer. Choose someone else, God. And we read, though, that God continued and in spite of his own limitations, Moses surrendered himself to God. And in our Acts passage, we read about Saul, like Moses, who fought against what God had in mind for him in terms of his life. Saul fought against the spirit of the living Christ. Early on, as we read in the Acts of the Apostles, this Saul thought that the followers of the way, and that's what Christians were called early on, were heretics. He was well-educated. He, he grew up in a Hellenistic culture of Tarsus, where he, he was raised by his family. He studied under the great Hebrew scholar Gamaliel in Jerusalem. And Saul heard the dying testimony of Stephen. As Stephen, as he died, professed Jesus as Messiah, and that burned into his mind and into his conscience. Biblical scholars believe and surmise that Saul wrestled with the fact of Jesus as God's Messiah, and somehow it even spurred him to persecute the Christians more as he attempted to prove that he was right. And somehow Stephen was wrong. And Paul refers to that episode from his early life later on in the Acts of the Apostles and later on in his ministry from Acts 22 when he wrote and said, or when he said, as recorded by Luke, while the blood of your witness, Stephen, was shed, I myself was standing by, approving and keeping the coats of those who killed him. He never forgot what he had done. He never forgot, and it haunted him. Disturbed by his doubts, scholars believe that Saul drove himself even harder into the persecution of the Christians because of the stain of the blood of, of Stephen on his conscience and because of his own limitation of his stubborn pride that he could not give in to the thought that he was wrong or that there was another way. What was true for Moses and Paul was true for other people in scriptures, flesh and blood people like Jazz A. Jones, like Charles, like Noah, Nona, excuse me, uh, Jeremiah who said, I am only a youth, Jonah who said, I don't want to have anything to do with these, with these people, calling them to repentance, the Ninevites. 
flesh and blood people like you and me, who at times are overcome and are prone to give in to our insecurities and to give excuses for our limitations, our foibles, our guilt, whatever. But if we are able to come to grips with these by the grace of God extended to us through someone as a friend, or through the, through the corporate worship service perhaps even today, and sense the power of God which enables us to overcome these limitations, a grace which reaches out to us to forgive us, to strengthen us, to redirect us, then these limitations can become avenues of service because they are surrendered to God. If, however, we still want to stay with our limitations and do not want to engage in the risky business, then we continue to hide behind our insecurities, whatever they may be. But the good news is that God's love does not give up on us and calls us, even now, in this service, to move past any perceived limitations that we have for ourselves, spiritually, psychologically, physically, or whatever, to be that what we were created to be and meant to be as disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus reminded his disciples of what it meant to be a disciple in terms of running the risk of surrendering, of giving oneself over to a power beyond oneself. For he wrote, for what was written by Matthew in terms of the words of Jesus are these words. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who will lose their life for my sake will find it. God's call to reluctant servants is to surrender past our limitations, whatever we perceive them to be. All of us are reluctant servants from one time, at one time or another, and I am no exception myself. But as reluctant servants caught in the bondage of any limitation, we hear these words of encouragement through these flesh and blood people from Scripture, through flesh and blood people about whom we live life, who live life with now. And from the words of the Apostle Paul as recorded in 1 Corinthians when he said, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. It's amazing how much potential is lost because people hide behind their limitations, whatever they perceive them to be spiritual, psychological, physical, or whatever. This is a personal note, but our daughter Sarah Dale is an inspiration to Martha Dale and to me, and yes, even now to her older brother, who is six years older than she. And really her encouragement is a spiritual thing to me, because at times I am a reluctant minister in terms of what I am about as a pastor, getting down in the dumps in terms of what I am not able to do or perceive myself not being able to do. But Sarah Dale was born with osteogenesis and perfected brittle bones, a genetic problem. And after 35 fractures and 16 operations, uh, Sarah Dale has not let any of these physical liabilities get in the way, any as limitations. In high school, even though she got around on a hand walker, on a wheelchair, uh, she was into everything. The marching band through a wheelchair, the glee club. She went to conferences. Montreat, she could not live in a glass prison. She had a zest for life, and her limitations were not going to get in the way. I remember uh, after we had moved to Wichita Falls, Texas, Sarah Dale was in the fourth grade, and Martha Dale went to school to get her out early with a pass, and it was P.E. Sarah Dale could not do things physically, but she vicariously lived through what other kids could do. And somehow she had talked the gym teacher into trying to let her climb a rope from the ceiling. And when Martha Dale went into the gym, Sarah Dale was not on the floor. And she looked around, and there was Sarah Dale, <laughs> 20 feet up in the air, had tremendous upper body strength, could beat everybody in the fourth grade arm wrestling, all the little boys. And they never forgot that all the way through grade school and junior high school. They had a lot of respect for Sarah Dale and her arm strength. At Austin College, Sherman, Texas, uh, where she graduated two years ago, a Presbyterian college in Texas, she was in, into everything. And her friend said she went about campus in her wheelchair like it was a chariot, I mean, just scooting here and there. And she's now in graduate school at North Texas State University in Denton with a master's degree, pursuing a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling, juggling time between graduate school, part-time work, and 
volunteer work at the Scottish Rite Hospital for Crippled Children in Dallas, Texas, where she had been a patient and operated on several times. Not being willing to live life in a glass prison. But many of us put ourselves in such a circumstance as that when we think that life is too risky to get past our own limitations, whatever we perceive them to be. And as a pastor, I must confess that there are times when I get down and I think that I spiritually, intellectually, physically do not have the wherewithal to do it. And for me, as a father, I think of my own daughter, who, in spite of her limitations, does not let them get in the way, even though she still has them. The words of the Apostle Paul remind us, who are reluctant servants from time to time, about life which can be lived fully because of our faith in Jesus Christ if we surrender these limitations to God. For he writes in 1 Corinthians, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Reluctant servants. The message this morning is that God's call to reluctant servants like you and me is past any perceived limitations. For if we surrender them to God, we are released from their bondage. Our scriptures are scriptures of encouragement to us this Sunday. With the empowerment of our Lord, when we are prone to be reluctant, we can let go with this power and let go of our alibis, let go of our excuses, let go of our guilt and experience the forgiveness of God, the power of God in our lives to move in and through and around and above any perceived limitations. God calls us to serve and to live life fully. Let us follow him and not be reluctant servants. Amen. Our God calls us to witness to our faith. Let us say what we believe as we repeat the words of the Apostles' Creed. All who are able are invited to stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Our God calls us also to the fellowship of prayer. Let us unite our hearts together in prayer. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, you're the giver of every good and perfect gift. And we come to give you thanks and praise for all of your goodness to us. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, who is our way, our truth, and our life. And we thank you for the call that he gives us to live in newness of life by the power of your Spirit. And our Father, we know that we are so reluctant to follow you oftentimes. 
and we offer many excuses. So our Father, help us to live in such a way that we may be open to following your will and to fulfill the purposes that Jesus Christ has for us in life. To that end, our Father, keep us from living ungratefully, but help us always to remember what you have done for us and all that we have received so generously and graciously in life. Keep us from living irresponsibly, and help us to remember that we must answer for the way in which we've used the precious blessings entrusted to us and keep us from living carelessly. Grant that we may never bring shame to ourselves nor heart hurt and sorrow to others because we did not stop to think. And keep us from living recklessly but grant that we may never foolishly flirt with temptation, but instead help us to have nothing to do with those temptations and things which we know to be wrong for us. And our Father, prevent us from living unsocially. Instead, may we take our full part in the life and work and service of your church and our community. And Lord, Keep us from living exclusively. Grant that we may never shut out any person from our life and fellowship because of color or economic circumstances or other factors. But Lord, grant us your unfailing guidance through our journey and make us ready and quick to respond to your call that we may find in you a new fulfillment and freedom, and that we may enjoy the fullness of that resurrection life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who said, I am come that you might have life, and that you might have it abundantly. Our God, we pray now for the needs of your people everywhere. We ask your blessing upon the hungry, the homeless, the dispossessed, the refugees. We pray your blessing upon our loved ones who are going through times of illness. We pray that you would minister to those who are shut in and limited because of age or infirmity, and that you would grant your perfect peace to those who are experiencing the loss of loved ones in these days. And above all, our Father, we ask you that as we leave this place today, it may be our desire to love you more dearly and to serve you more faithfully. For we make this prayer in the name and for the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let us now with generous hearts give our tithes and our offerings to him.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, you call us reluctant servants, though we are, to be disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, witnesses of the good news, and stewards of the great blessing that you have entrusted to our hands. Our Father, as we come with these tangible and monetary gifts, may we also come with our hearts, giving you that which you desire the most, the gift of ourself. Receive us and receive our offering for Christ's sake. Amen. Love of our Lord Jesus Christ enable us not to be reluctant servants with life, but for those who surrender ourselves to Him as Lord. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you, both now and forevermore. Mm -hmm. 